Christian life is a, is a, it's a life of faith. We got in it by faith and we, we live it by faith. And when you read that story there that we looked at earlier in John chapter 4, you read through there and you find here again we have a life that's been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. This, this nobleman comes to him and, and here's a man, a, a royal official, who needed help and he came to Jesus. His child was seriously ill and, and verse number 47 says he was at the point of death. In other words, he'd almost waited too long. And, and I, I, I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, and, I, and I thought, you know, it says he's at the point of death. So you might think, well, he's almost waited too long. He's at the point of death. Then I thought, death doesn't matter to Jesus. He's raised folks from the dead. And it's never too late to come to Him. It's never too late to reverse your field. It's never too late to turn your life around and come to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. Amen. This fellow here, he comes to Him, he turns to Jesus for help. But you know, as you read through here and, and, and through the Bible, especially in the Gospel of John, but as you read through, you find all of these circumstances that, that brought people to Jesus. In Mark chapter 10, uh, it was physical blindness that brought the beggar to Jesus. In uh, Mark chapter 5, it was Satan's hold on that, that gathering demoniac there that was cutting himself. It was, it was Satan's hold on him that brought him to Jesus. In Luke chapter 8, it was the imminent death of a 12-year-old girl that led the father to go to Jesus. It was Nathaniel's religious emptiness that caused him to come to Christ. Nicodemus, you remember him in John chapter 3, came to Jesus by night. He was troubled in heart and troubled in mind. And that's what brought him out of the city of Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives that night to go find Jesus and to talk to him. It was 12 years of physical suffering which brought the little woman with an issue of blood to Jesus. It was a paralyzing condition of their friend that caused four men to pick him up and take him to Jesus and lower him down through the roof. A dying servant was the motivation for a centurion to come to the Savior. In each case, Jesus took the bad and transformed it into something good. He took the mess that had, that had come along in someone's life and those outward conditions and, and circumstances may not have seemed like the best and yet they revealed the a need in each person's life. I've said it many times and I'm sure Brother Tom can attest to the fact one of the greatest evangelists of our time and our day is cancer. Because somebody gets cancer and somebody who's not right with the Lord. I, I've told you many times about a, a fellow in Virginia, an old coal miner, uh, Junior Jackson. Junior was, Junior was mean. And I went to see Junior one time and his wife, and his wife came to church. And, and, uh, and, and, and so I just stopped by to see him one day. And he wouldn't take his eyes off the TV set. NASCAR was on. And he, I'm trying to talk to him. And he's watching NASCAR. <clears throat> You know how you watch NASCAR. Look, they're turning left. And so anyway, he, he, he's watching NASCAR. Wouldn't listen. But he got cancer. Nothing wrong with NASCAR. I'm just kidding with you. He got cancer. He got brain cancer. And they sent him down to Johnson City or Knoxville. And so I went down there before he had surgery. And, uh, and I went down there, went in the little room there before they took him back. And his wife was sitting there. And, and I, I, I asked him, you know, are you... About the Lord, he just he wouldn't say a thing. He just he wasn't friendly at all. I found out later when I had prayer with him, and I found out later when I left. As soon as I left the room, he curled up his fist and hit his wife for me being there. And uh, just a just a tough old guy. They went in for surgery and they brought him back out and said there wasn't nothing they could do for him. They took part of his brain out. They had, had brain cancer and they took part of it. And uh, and and so they sent him home. And I went over there one day, and the day that he got home, or the day after he got home, and I asked, knocked at the door, and I think, I think her name, I can't, I'm trying to remember his wife's name, I think it was Lorraine, and Lorraine came to the door, and, and I talked to her, and I, she, I said, Is there, she said, there's nothing they can do for him. And I said, does he know it? And she said, no, nobody's told him yet. And I said, well, can I go tell him? And she said, yeah, go back there and tell him. They had taken the part of his brain that all he could say was my, my. Anytime he tried to talk, all he could say was my, 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 my. And 
I went back there and I knelt down beside a little bed and I said, Junior, I know that you went through the surgery and I, I know that, uh, you know, they, they sent you home. I said, Junior, there's nothing they can do for you. I said, Junior, you're going to die. I said, Junior, you need to trust Christ as your Savior. I said, uh, Junior, don't you, want, don't you want to trust Jesus to save you? He shook his head like that, and I looked over at him, and a tear was rolling down his, his cheek. And I said, Junior, I want you to pray this prayer with me and really mean business in your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry for my sins, and I ask you to come into my heart and save me now. Take me to heaven when I die. I'm trusting you, Jesus, to save me. In Jesus' name. And I said, now, Junior, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to take my hand. He took my hand. And I prayed, thank you, thank Lord, for you, what Jesus. you've done for me. Thank you for saving me. When we got there, I got up. And I said, well, Junior, God bless you, man. He said, my, 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 my. <laughs> That's all he could say. And he wanted to be baptized. And he wouldn't wait till Sunday. We had to baptize him. I think it was the next day. He was in a wheelchair. And Brother Larry Honeaker and I, we, we, had the, we ran the water and heated it up. Called everybody in the neighborhood. Junior Jackson got saved. Hey, Junior Jackson's going to be baptized. Amen. We got a video of it somewhere. And I have asked and asked and asked. But anybody from Pilgrim's Knob who's watching this, find the video for me. I truly would like to see Junior Jackson's baptism on there. I know that some of them watch it on Facebook. So, uh, uh, but hey, what was it that finally got to him? Cancer. It, it, and, and so we say... And, and, and I know, you know, bless her heart, June's facing. She's gone through it for, for a long, long time. And we think sometimes we think, well, boy, uh, when you get sick, that's a bad thing. No. Hey, listen, if I'm in God's will, whatever comes is in God's will and thank the Lord for it. I may not like it. And I may not like it when something comes in somebody else's life. But hey, take what it is. All things work together for good. Take it and use it for God. And if it takes that to get you to be close to God, then amen. That's a good thing, right? Right. Say amen right there. Troubles and trials come in everybody's life. Troubles and trials will come. And, 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 and you know, with some people, the Bible says it rains on the just as well as the unjust. But the difference is how you respond to it. You know, some bad thing happened to some person, and, and they say, I had a lady tell me years ago, if God's so good, why did I get cancer? And I thought to myself, you know, God's really good. If you've lived this long, He's been mighty good to you. I mean, God's been good to us, amen? And if I was to fall over dead today, I'd just go on to heaven praising the Lord. I, just, and I told my wife, I said, I want a DNR. If I ever go in the hospital, a DNR, you put that on my chart, do not resuscitate. If you, if you perform the, the hemlock maneuver on me and bring me back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be mad. I mean, if I pass out, fall over, and, and, and you bring me back, uh-uh, uh-uh, I'm ready to go. I know, I said, well, I said well, who, who in here, who in here would miss me? Somebody says, I would, preacher, you owe me some money. <laughs> but listen, listen, this world will pale in, into comparison when you think about the things we've got over there. So whatever your situation is, whatever's come, whatever it might be, use it. Let it draw you closer to the Lord. Now let's look at this guy right quick in the few minutes that we have left. Won't you see some things? First of all, he came to Jesus with a deceptive faith. Now, before he ever says anything, Jesus had read his mind. Before he ever said anything, Jesus knew he was coming and he knew what he was thinking. Look in verse 48. John chapter 4 and verse 48. He says there, you know, he comes to Jesus, uh, the, the, the kids at the point of death, and verse number 48, Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The guy didn't even get a chance to say anything. But here, here's what I think was happening. He was coming to Jesus. He had heard about all these things that Jesus had done. And so he heard about Jesus. And so he's coming to him. And he's, he's, I think in his own heart and mind, he'd made his mind up. I am not going to believe in this guy until I see him do something. I am not going to believe in this guy, Jesus, until I see him perform some miracle. And so when he comes to Jesus, I think Jesus spoke this. And it, it doesn't necessarily say, but I think he spoke it as a question. 
Think about it. The guy comes up and, and he walks up to Jesus and maybe Jesus said, except you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. In other words, he knew what was going on inside. You know, really? Is that, what, is that your standard? He had a deceptive faith. You see, he didn't want to walk by faith. He wanted to walk by sight. He didn't want, he didn't want to say, oh, I'm going to trust you. You remember what happened back in the earlier chapter over here of John chapter 4? Jesus did the same thing with the woman at the well. You know, he talked to her and he said, uh, you know, go call thy husband. And she said, I have no husband. And then he said, thou hast well said I have no husband. You got five husbands and the one you're with now is not true. She said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I perceive that you're a prophet. He wasn't a prophet. He was the son of God. Amen. Amen. And he came and he knew all about it. But you know what? He knows all about you too. He knows what's going on in our heart, in our mind. And he understood. He needed to believe. This man had to put aside that idea that he had. Back over in John chapter 4 when Jesus is talking to that woman and, and he says, they, they're carrying on a conversation and in John chapter 4 verse 21 he says, woman, believe me. Amen. Woman, believe me. And that's the issue. The issue is, do you believe him or do you not believe him? If you believe him, then live like it. Believe me. Believe what he said. In fact, the purpose of the book of John, let me read John chapter 20. The Gospel of John was written that you might believe in Jesus and believe in trusting in Him and know that He'll take care of you. Listen to this in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. The Gospel of John was written for you to believe that Jesus was who He said He was. Amen. When I talked to, to Jacob uh, a few weeks ago in prison, and I said, Jacob, now you've trusted Christ as your Savior. You need to start reading the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John has very simple words in it. There's, there's very few words, and I, I'm, I'm not even going to venture to, to guess. I think I recall, but I'm not sure. But there are very few words in the Gospel of John. He just uses these words over and over again. And it's very simple. And the simplest book of the Gospels is the Gospel of John, and it's written that we might believe in Jesus. You know, we go to the Gospel of John and we find over and over again where he's performing miracles. And Jesus was a miracle worker. But it's a deceptive faith that always has to have a sign. A deceptive faith that always seeks proof. You can't just believe. A deceptive faith tries to put God in a test tube. It's a deceptive faith that, that says, I, I'm not going to... A deceptive faith says, seeing is believing when God says believing is seeing. Signs are not for the spiritual crowd. Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, the scribes and the Pharisees, they mocked Him and they said, He saved others Himself He cannot save. If He be the King of Israel, let Him come down now from the cross and we will believe Him. They were lying because He rose from the grave three days later and they never Amen. believed Him. Right. And, and Jesus said, if you want me to come down, i got one better for you. I'll rise from the dead. And they still didn't believe you see, our life is a life of faith. And just like when she sang the song there about the roses that will bloom again, just because we might be going through the valley of the shadow of death, God's still in control. Amen. He's Amen. still on the throne. He's still in control. He knows what He's doing in your life. And what we need to do is we need to trust Him and we need to take our hands off the wheel and let Him be the driver. And we just follow along. We'll just follow along. Jesus, you just lead me and I'll follow you. Draw nigh unto God and He'll draw nigh unto you. I, I wrote about it earlier this week and, and uh, posted it. <clears throat> but um, he says, in, in Proverbs, he says, uh, he says, I will guide thee with mine eye. And he said, be not like the horse that has the bit and the bridle. And what he's saying is he's making a contrast between two ways of being led by God. He says, don't be like the horse that has the bit and the bridle. The bit and the bridle are painful. The bit and the bridle there, you know, when the horse is going along and wants to go this way, he pulls it to go that way. And, and he, pulled, he has to make it go. Those are outside things that cause that horse to go that way. And that's what it is when we let circumstances dictate our lives. Right. We let circumstances, you know, something bad happens. And, Maybe, you know, maybe we get we get a little money in the bank and we think, you know, I don't need church anymore and I don't need God's house anymore. And so we, we get away from God and then we lose our job. What is that? That's the bitten bridle trying to bring you back to God. 
we think, well, I, you know, I've, I've, I've got to the point where, where I don't need to really give anymore. We, we haven't learned to trust God yet. And, and troubles come. And yet God says, I will guide you with my eye. Now, how in the world can God guide you with His eye? Have you ever hid something from a kid, but you wanted them to find it? Now, follow me just a minute. You know, the kid comes in the room, and, and you've got, you said, I got you, I got you a candy bar if you can find it. Now, you've hid it under a plant over there. And he starts looking around. He starts looking. When he looks at you, what do you do? Uh, if you can find it, and you look over at that plant. You're hoping he's going to get it. You know, you're hoping he finds it. Or, or hey, everybody, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, you know. And, but see, when you're walking with God and you're looking at God, to, to let God guide you by his eyes means you're close enough to see him. Amen. Through the eye of faith. You're close enough to know what he wants you to do. How do you know that God wants you to go there to pastor? How do you know that God wants you to, do, to take this job? How do you know that God wants you to... Well, I just know. How do you know? Because I've been looking in the face of God, and I believe that's where he wants me to go. Amen. And so we walk with him. We bring our problems to him. We bring our troubles to him. The Bible says that we're saved by faith, Ephesians chapter 2. We're saved when we trusted Christ as our Savior and we put our faith and trust in Him. And then we start following Him. Then we start working. Then we start serving. And God has a place for all of us. You know, Jesus, he, His own testimony shows that, that those who put their faith in signs and wonders are not always even saved. He said, you know, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name? And in Thy name done many wonderful works? And in Thy name cast out devils? And did all these wonderful things. And Jesus said, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Friend, it doesn't matter what you can do for the Lord or for the church. If you've never trusted Christ, you're not going to make it to heaven. Right. And you, it, it's got to start by faith. And so the fellow had a son who was sick. And so he comes to Jesus and he says, uh, and well, he didn't get a chance to say anything. He comes to Jesus and he starts to say something. And Jesus said, Except you see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe? And I think that's how he said it. And the guy was taken aback because that's what he'd been thinking. And so he realized that he was in the presence of somebody who knew all about him. A friend of mine, when we were dealing with God, when we are dealing with Jesus Christ, you might hide it from the church folks, you might hide it from the preacher, you might hide it from the Sunday school teacher, you might hide it from mom and dad, but God knows what's going on in that head and in that heart. Amen? Amen. God knows what's taking place, and you're going to have to deal with Him in the, in the end anyway. Signs mean nothing. Jesus told him, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. It was a deceptive faith. But then He had a decisive faith. Look at verse 49. As soon as Jesus spoke, He disarmed him. As soon as Jesus spoke, the, the guy had nothing else to say. You know, a guy couldn't ask for anything. He just said in verse 49, The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed in the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. The man, through hearing one sentence from Jesus Christ, one sentence changed his whole philosophy of life. One sentence from Jesus changed his outlook on life and changed his heart. Jesus had, had said, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And, the, and the, the nobleman realized who he was dealing with. And so when he believed, he believed when he saw the person of Christ. He came to Jesus. He came face to face with Jesus and was changed. You know, it's always been that way from the very time that Jesus was born. He's been changing lives ever since. Amen? Amen. You think about those, uh, those three wise men. The Bible says when they came to Jesus and, and, and they departed. And the Bible says when they departed, they departed unto their own country another way. And friend of mine, when you come to Jesus, you're going to go home another way. Amen? Amen. You ain't going to go back. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. The things I used to think, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. Amen? He's made it. And if there ain't a change, I wonder if you're really saved. you got to be sure. You need to check up from the neck up, or you maybe need to check your heart. The Hebrew Christians were facing... Persecution. The Hebrew Christians were facing a tough time. They're facing troubles. And yet Paul writes to them and says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Wherefore sin we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with let us uh, lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. 
You know, I can handle anything if I know He's with me. I can handle just about anything if I know I'm right with Him. I can handle just about anything when I know that, that, that I'm doing it for Him. Whatever comes around here, whatever might happen because of what I'm doing, as long as I'm right with Him, that's all that matters. Amen? Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. I was talking to somebody this week. Uh, within the last few days when we were talking about persecution and we were talking about certain neighborhoods and I forgot exactly what we were talking about and I've, I've mentioned it to you before and he said something about getting killed and I said, yeah, somebody comes up to a Christian and says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to tell them, hey, don't threaten me with heaven. I mean, because that's where I'm going. I mean, that's where we're going. And, and the things of this earth, you know, people are talking about the <laughs> the medical system and all these things that are changing and, and you may not like it, you may like it, you may not like it, but listen, ultimately we're going to die. We're all going to die. I mean, you, you know, you can, you can do better and you can do better and you get better and you prosper. We're all going to die. What's the old saying? You'll live till you die if you don't get killed and that's true. We're all going to die. And so when we die, we're going to spend eternity somewhere. We're going to spend eternity. You know, eternity is not way out there. Way, way, way out there. Way out there yonder. You know how far eternity is? It's one heartbeat away. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you need to make arrangements today by trusting Christ today. We have the problems and things that come around us and they drive us to the Lord. The nobleman came face to face with Jesus and had driven him to him. He believed him when he saw the person of Christ and he believed when he heard the promises of Christ. Jesus said, go thy way, thy son liveth. He heard Jesus speak those words and he believed what he said. And he believed, you know, he'd probably done all that he could physically do. And so Jesus speaks and, you know, he, he, he heard him speak. And it's like when the, when the, the report was come back to the religious leaders when they were talking about Jesus. And the religious leader says, says, where is he? They had sent some men to get him, and they couldn't get him. They wouldn't get him. And then they come back to the religious leaders, and they said, where is he? And they said, never a man spake like this man. Nobody's ever spoken like him. He spoke with authority. The nobleman came to Jesus in his despair and in his distress for his son. He had reached the crisis of faith. Verse number 49, the nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. He wasn't going to argue with him. He, he, he's long past the point of, of, of trying, to, trying to make a deal with him. He just said, just come down because my child is going to die. He no longer wanted to see signs and wonders. He, he just wanted Jesus. But Jesus didn't come. He spoke a word and it was so. Go thy way. Thy son liveth. It was such a simple thing. Just, just believe. Just come to him in faith. It, it, was, no, it was no big thing. You know, he, he came to him. You know, the Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I think the sad fact with many people is they stumble over the simplicity of salvation. I think, brother, many people look at it and say there's got to be more to it than that. There, there's, there's surely got to be more to it than that. There's, there's, got to be, there's got to be some work involved. Hey, friend, Jesus did the work. He paid the price. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Some people say, well, I, you know, I, I, really, I really need to do something. I, I need to do, maybe I need to be baptized or, or I need to rub my hand through some rosary beads. I need to do something. Surely there's something we can do. Listen, anything you do is going to mess it up. Amen. Anything you add to it, it becomes works. You've got to totally put your faith and trust in Him. And it's no great thing. You know, there's a story back in, in 2 Kings, in 2 Kings, chapter, 2 Kings chapter 5. There's a story about Naaman. Naaman was a great man with his master. Naaman was a, was a, uh, a captain of the host of Syria. And it says in verse 1 that Naaman was a great man with his master, but he was a leper. And it come to pass that he... He, he, got, he got this leprosy, and, and there's a little servant girl that says, she said, whoa, if you was only down in the land of Israel, you could, you could be healed, and, and you could have deliverance. And so the king of Syria, he sent a note to the king of Israel, and he said, I've got a fellow, I've got this fellow here, he's got, I got uh, uh, leprosy, and, and I, I, need him to be, I need him to be healed. Well, the king of Israel says, oh, man, the guy's trying to pick a fight with me. 
He said, I don't know how to heal this guy. He's looking at it from strictly a political point of view. And so Elisha hears about it, or Elijah hears about it, and, and he says, uh, I'll tell you what, if you'll send him down, uh, some old servant says, if you'll send him down there to, uh, to Elijah, he can help him, Elisha. And so he goes down there to Elijah, Elisha's house, and uh, Elisha's in the house, and the, you know, the Naaman, he rides up there on the, with his chariot and his horses and all of his entourage and all of the gold and silver that he's brought, and he brought all that stuff there. And I'm sure they're unloading the gold and silver and all this stuff because they want Elisha to come out and heal him of his leprosy, and Elijah doesn't, Elisha doesn't even come out. He just sends word and says, go tell him to dip seven times in the Jordan River. Naaman hears that. And it makes him mad. Seven times in the Jordan. He goes, hey, are not rivers of Abana and Pethlar and Damascus better than that ditch over there they call a river? I'm not going to. Put all that stuff back up. Put all that. We're going home. Put all that stuff back up. And we're leaving. And his servants come over to him and say, Master, if he'd come out and bid you do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much simpler would it be for you to just go down there and dip seven times in the Jordan? And so he does. He goes down there. I have a, I have a message I preached to the kids in junior church called Seven Ducks in Muddy Water. And he goes down there and he dips down one time. And I'm sure, you know, that's below his pride. I mean, he's a great man with his master. And he's got to go dip in that old muddy stream down there. But he had to put his pride aside and go down there. And he dips once. And he comes up and he says... I'm not getting any better. And he dips twice and he comes back up and he says, this is not working. They said, stay down there. This is all my, my version of it. I'm mean, just adding a little bit. And then they said, uh, he dips the third time. Still no better. The fourth time, still no better. Well, I hope nobody I know sees me doing this. And dips down again five times. Dips down six times. And I'm, I'm sure he's thinking, man, this should be enough right here. This should be enough. One more time. Just one more time, dip. And he did it, and on the seventh time, the Bible says his skin was clean as a baby's. White as snow. He was healed. Why? Because he believed the word that the prophet had spoken. You know, somebody told me a story one time. It's, it's probably, probably one of them stories preachers tell, you know, Tom. It, 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 it ain't true, but it sure sounds good. And uh, uh, somebody said uh, the, the, the farmer, he had a fellow working for him. And he, he asked, the, you know, the fellow that worked for him was just always happy and, and always joyful. And, and the, the old rich farmer, he said, he said, why are you so happy? He said, because I'm a Christian. And I, I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. And the farmer said, well, man, I'd like to have the joy you've got. What do I have to do to be saved? He said, you've got to be willing to get down in that hog pen and waller around with them hogs. He said, I'm not going to do that. And so he went his way, and you know, days went by, weeks went by, and, and he'd come back and he said, Man, tell me again what I have to do to be saved. And he said, You've got to get in there and wallow around with them hogs in that mud down there. You've got you to be willing to, to get down there and, 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 and just get all nasty. And he said, I, I, I just can't do it. But it just kept bothering him, it kept bothering him, it kept bothering him, until finally he came to the, the, the farmhand there. And the, the old owner starts climbing up on the fence. And he said, man, what are you doing? He said, I'm fixing to get in that hog pen and wall around like you told me. He said, hey, you don't have to do it. You just got to be willing to do it. And a lot of times it's not the fact that you know, we, we got to do this great thing. If you've ever dealt with the conviction where God's convicted you, especially about your salvation, it just overwhelms you. You know, somebody said, I know why they call them tracks. They track me to the grocery store. They track me to work. They track me when I'm hunting. And that conviction will drive you to the point where whatever it takes, I'll do it. But hey, there's nothing to it. All you've got to do is trust Christ as you say. You know, the, I use the illustration of this old stool here. The Bible says being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Being fully persuaded is... I believe this stool can hold me up. Yes, even this stool can hold me up. And so I'm going to say, you know, I'm fully persuaded that this stool's going to hold me up. So I put all my weight on it. That's 100%. Well, salvation is being fully persuaded that Jesus will save you. Amen. If you're saying, if you're saying, I believe it's Jesus and me, then you're not trusting it 100%. You've got a foot on the ground. You've got, I believe I've got a, I believe I've got a live right. But well, you're not trusting Jesus. He said, well, I believe I've got to be baptized and you're not trusting Jesus. When you finally realize that there's nothing you can do, then you just say, Jesus, I'm trusting you. 
It's all of Him. And He trusted Him. Now, I want you to see one word, and I'm going to close with this. Because this word is an amazing word. And it's in here. It's just a simple word, but I want you to see something. I'm going to skip some stuff here. He believed in Jesus. He believed what He said. I want you to read with me, or you can look there if you are. Verse 50, He said, Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them when the hour when he began to amend. Now get this, here's the word. And they said unto him, Yesterday. Capernaum is only 12 miles from where Jesus is. And he could have made the journey in a couple of hours. He could have left and he could have gone. But you see, he trusted that Jesus, what Jesus had said, he trusted that Jesus' word was true. And so he just hung around in town for a while. He didn't go directly back. There's nothing he could do anyway. What did he do? He trusted what he said. And so he waited around till the next day. He said, when, when, did, when did he begin to mend? Yesterday. It was yesterday when he talked to Jesus. And he knew that that's what happened. You see, now he's got dynamic faith. Now he's acting on his faith. And friend of mine, when you have real saving faith, you'll act on it. When you have real saving faith, you'll live by it. When you have real saving faith, it'll make a difference in your life. Amen? It'll make a change in your life. He had a spiritual maturity. Look at verse 53. Verse 53 says, So the Father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed. He said, man, I believed on him yesterday. And now I'm seeing the proof. You see what I'm saying? He had come to Jesus saying, seeing is believing. And Jesus said, really, believing is seeing it. Now he sees it. You know, you say, well, let's think about trusting Jesus. It sure seems awful simple, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust Jesus. And then your Holy Spirit comes within you to live, and you have a peace, and you have a joy, and you've got a, a foretaste of glory divine we sing about. A friend of mine, one of these days, faith is going to give way to sight, and I'm going to see him, amen? amen? One of these days, faith is going to give way to sight, and I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be there for all eternity, and I don't have to worry about the old sin anymore. I don't have to worry about the old life anymore. I don't have to worry about the old sin anymore, no temptation anymore. I'm on my way to heaven. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning. I don't want to wait till in the morning. Let's go now. I'll pass out the Kool-Aid here in just a minute, but <laughs> not, not quite, not quite. A friend of mine, if you trust Christ as your Savior, He'll change your life. He'll make a difference in your life. Not only did it affect Him, but I want you to see something. There was spiritual maturity, but there's also spiritual activity. Look at verse 53. The last line of verse 53 says, And himself believed, and his whole house. He led his family to the Lord. He went and reached others. You see, when you come to Jesus in faith, you got something that, that's not, it's not just going to stay in you. Rivers of water shall overflow from the inside. You've got to tell somebody else about Him. Remember what happened with the, with the woman at the well? She had to go to the well during the day because she was a sinful woman. She had a bad reputation in town. All the other women would come to the well in the morning when it was cool or in the evening when it was cool, but she had to come to the well in the heat of the day. Jesus was there, and as she came to the well, Jesus said, Give me to drink. Uh, give me a drink of water. And, and she said, Sir, how is it that thou being a Jew speakest me with the woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. He said, Woman, you don't know what you're talking about. You, you say go worship over here, worship over there. He said, and he's talking to you. He said, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask him for spiritual water and, and, and you'd never thirst again. She said, sir, give me that water that I uh, never thirst and neither come hither to draw. He said, go call thy husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, you've well said you don't have a husband. You had five husbands and the one you got now is not your husband. She said, well, I perceive you're a prophet. And they began to talk and she said, she said I know that when Messiah comes, he will, he will lead us into all things. Some people say Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Jesus never claimed to be God. He claimed it in John chapter 4. He said to the woman, I that speak unto thee am He. And that woman, she got so excited, the Bible says she left her water pot. Why'd she leave her water pot? She didn't need that old broken down water pot anymore. She met the Master. 
She met the master. She got it on the inside. So what'd she do? She went back to town and she began to tell everybody, hey, hey, come see a man. Told me everything I ever did. Really everything? Well, not everything, but most everything. Come see a man. And they began to come out. They began to flock out there to come see him. And Jesus, the disciples came up and Jesus was, you know, none of the disciples said, why are you talking to that woman? But they wondered about him. They said, Master, here, have something to eat. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And they said, well, somebody bring him a sandwich or something? Somebody bring him something? No. He said, look, look. The field is ripe unto harvest. Now, here's the picture. They, she ran back into the city. And she began to tell everybody, hey, come meet a man. Tell me everything I ever did. And the men are watching her. They know her. She's a loose woman. They know her. She, yeah. They, and so the men, it's the men. They said, well, somebody's changed her life. And the Bible says the men begin to flock out to see Jesus. And when Jesus said to his disciples, lift up your eyes, look, the fields are white to harvest. I think he's pointing to the men who are coming out to see him. Friend of mine, the field is white to harvest. There's a whole world out there that needs to know about what we've got in here. There's a whole world out there that needs to know, hey, hey, hey. I found him, and, and he found me, but I got him. You can argue about how he got there, but he's here, amen? amen. You can argue about whether he, he found me or I found him, but he's here. Amen. And our job is to let him make a difference in our lives and then go out there and tell them why. Because the field is white to harvest. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in Jesus.